<coughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. Let's get started. All right. So, uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, I'd like to thank Paul Sicardis and Jerry Crone for arranging this, and I'd especially like to thank everyone who turned out for this. It's been fairly easy to draw crowds with this subject, and uh, you know, artists intentionally marking their paintings, patterns that span centuries. It's a great mystery, a subject of my talk, and uh, one that doesn't have a lot of answers just yet, but the more people who hear it, the more per uh, no, excuse me, the more progress we're going to be able to make. Uh, that's my thinking anyway, so let's get started. Uh, first, I'm going to give some background on the various art conservation and attribution processes that allowed me to make these findings. Then I will discuss the correlations found between various paintings, followed by specifics of the markings as we've seen them so far. Then I'm going to introduce some of the theories that have been produced, both by myself and others, to explain these markings. I'm going to keep this a summary of my work so uh, that we can have plenty of time for a Q&A session, which I'm sure you're all eager to get to. Uh, like I said, the more people who set their minds to work on matching these markings up, the more likely we are to find some concrete answers, or at least you know, get us going in the right direction. Uh, so first I want to give some background on brushstroke-based analysis. Uh, as we have, uh, as we all know, uh, painterly use a pattern of paint trails uh, on their works. So he or she drags the brush across the surface. Some are minuscule, some are highly pronounced. When you see a great clumps of paint on a canvas, like in a Van Gogh, such as his famous bedroom at Arles, seen here, that is called impasto. Uh, we have special equipment that analyzes how thickly the paint is applied, the level of the brush strokes, let's say. Uh, the computers uh, that we use look at the work from different angles to determine the angles of the brush strokes, that is, how they move across the cam uh, canvas. Are they vertical, this angle, that angle? Um, so once they have done that, they count how many are verticals, how many are horizontal, etc., for six different angles. The computer then combines these separate angles together to see where they overlap. The map is first in turned into a color photograph, which is then turned into a black and white scan that makes it a lot easier for us to you know, see what is where. Uh, one quality of this analysis is that the more brush strokes an artist uses in a particular area, the lighter it will show up on these images. Uh, so as you can see here, do we have that? Yeah, yeah, okay, good. Uh, alternatively, the fewer brush strokes that are used, the darker the area of the painting appears. So when you look here, uh, where the, there are more brush strokes, it becomes lighter and lighter, while the areas with hardly any are very dark. So the amount of brush strokes used in a painting can be a key clue in determining whether or not a painting is authentic. For example, there is a well-known Van Gogh fake, the forger, in an attempt to mimic Van Gogh's style of thickly applied paint, went a little overboard, as you can see here. When you compare it to the authentic bedroom on the other side, uh, you can see there's a huge difference in the color. Clearly, this was not done by the man himself. Um, so uh, what began my journey was when my team was asked to take a look at the allegory of Venus and Cupid by an imitator of Titian. Uh, looking at the x-ray we took, I noticed that there were anomalous areas of heavy brush stroke use. So, you know, the painting would be normal levels of gray and white, and then there would be really bright areas. Uh, the rest of the painting was fairly even, but there were ten areas, small circles, of highly concentrated brush strokes, uh, highlighted by the red circles here. They, as I mentioned before, uh, appeared... Oh, excuse me, I lost my... appeared as very bright areas compared to the rest of the painting. It's very striking and very distinct. Uh, upon examining the surface of the painting closer, we found that where these heavy brushstroke areas appeared, there were visible markings on the surface of the painting. Uh, they were mostly little small tears, you know, areas of wear and tear, um, and all of these together would not raise any questions at all. I mean, it was a rather old painting. Um, you know, they were all things that we see day in and day out, but the fact that they lined up with the markings with the uh, areas of highly concentrated brush strokes, that certainly raised our eyebrows. Uh, I mean, what, what can we do but chalk it up to coincidence? So there 
nobody had ever seen anything like this before. We had our theories, but to be quite honest, none of us really spent that much time or effort trying to explain it to ourselves, let alone anyone else. You know, strange coincidences, especially ones such as this, are usually just that, a strange coincidence. And it wasn't until several months later, while attending the American Institute for Conservation's annual conference, that the plot, as they say, began to thicken. Uh, I happened to find myself in conversation with some acquaintances from various museums and auction houses. The conversation, unsurprisingly, revolved around our most recent projects, the problems they were posing, interesting acquisitions, and so on. Uh, I brought up the markings on allegory, you know, it hadn't completely left my mind. Um, uh, and most of the conversation circles sort of shrugged or chuckled at what was surely a bizarre coincidence, but one, Yolandi Otark, looked like she had been struck by a bolt of lightning. She informed me that she had come across the same bizarre coincidence. A painting that had highly concentrated buildups of brushstrokes, unrelated to the subject of the painting, I should emphasize, that corresponds to visible blemishes on the surface. She had seen it too. Well, with a rush of excitement, we began to compare specifics, the subject of the work, where it was made, when, the size of it, the number of markings, where they were placed, and we found no correlation. The only common factor we found was how the marks were found and how they appeared. That is, they were little tears, nothing that would seem too out of the ordinary. This only served to intrigue us further, though. We quickly sent out an APB to all of our colleagues, saying, have you observed anomalous concentrations of brushstrokes which correspond to visual marks or areas of damage on the surface? It uh, took us some time to get any response other than, I'll look into it when I have time. Clearly not a high priority case for most of our colleagues. And uh, you know, it was not as if I had found full time myself to pursue this. Duty called and I was kept busy with various other jobs and projects. I uh, knew finding that any other works with the same pattern was a very long shot, uh, my conversation with Otark aside, um, and I still wasn't sure what plans had aligned to bring us together. You know, I mean, it, it uh, seemed like even less of a hope that reaching out to others we would find anything else. I mean, how many paintings are there in the world? How many people working on them? How many people would have found this as well? Uh, you know, I tried to push it out of my mind as best as I could so I wouldn't get my hopes up, you know, I had real work to do. And I had almost succeeded in overcoming my curiosity when, after about three months, uh, we began to get some results. Roger Wentz at Sotheby's responded first with a landscape by Arpigny, which you can see here, which had seven marks, highlighted again by the red circles. Uh, again, the only similarities between the ones that Yolandi and myself had found in this one were the brush strokes and matching blemishes. You know, different time period, different place, different subjects. Uh, and then after another three months, we had found four more, all with the same pattern of results. I guess I shouldn't say pattern, that's a little confusing. All with the same correspondences. You know, nothing subject, time, place, but the concentrated brush strokes and the marks. Um, only one of them was sent to us by another conservator. Uh, the other two we found in a couple rather obscure publications. Uh, I still <laughs> don't know how to pronounce this quite right. Lindhern Singar, uh, that is art exhibitions out of Iceland, and La Actuellement from France. Uh, we were just the first to connect the dots, so to speak, between work that we had found and finding ones that others had come across. So the works span across centuries and across continents styles and subject matter, even the spread of the markings varied. Some were closer, some were more spread apart, and they all had between 6 to 15, which is you know, still a bit of a spread. So while pondering that particular fact, the different spreads of the markings, I made a thrilling discovery. Allegory of, allegory of Venus and a mid-18th century thanka of uh, depicting the Qin, Qinlong Emperor in a llama dress, despite the different sizes of the works, these two did in fact have the exact same markings, or pattern of markings. If we resized and reoriented the works like so, the markings lined up perfectly. These paintings were made nearly 100 years apart, halfway across the world from each other, and yet they have the same pattern. I thought I'd fallen asleep at my desk that I was dreaming, but you can, I mean, you can see it right here for yourself. 
And uh, in the last two years since I began working on this, we've compiled 16 works. Among those have identified three pairs that match up. Besides Allegory of Venus and the Thanga, which I was just talking about, we also found that Kandinsky's famous yellow, red, blue, and Manet's Bar at the Folie Bergère pair up, as well as Carlos Nadal's La Plage from the mid 20th century and a 16th century Spanish work, the subject of which is the Fountain of Life, currently at the Allen Memorial Art Museum in Oberlin. So, I mean, the odds of this happening by coincidence, I think, are incredibly small. I mean, there's no way of knowing how many works that have been marked like this that have been lost. So to think that in this small sample we found three pairs, that six paintings that match up, I mean, it's, it's astounding. It's, it's almost as if someone wants us to find them. I mean, no living artist as of yet has produced such a painting with the markings, or maybe they have and we just haven't x-rayed the right one or looked closely enough. It could, could be out there, but as far as we know in all of our research, we have not been able to find any interviews or written records of an artist explaining why they would mar their paintings in such a specific way. We also couldn't find any evidence to suggest that the artists themselves were aware of the other artists' markings. I mean, the differences in time, geographical locations, and the lack of technology we used to find these things would make it entirely impossible for this to happen, and yet, clearly, it, it happened. So this is where we leap into the realm of pure speculation. Why did these artists do it? Were they coerced? Is there some secret agreement amongst the artists of the world? It sounds fantastical and conspiratorial, but what more can we ask or assume? And we appreciate the power of public sourcing. If you come across any such patterns in any of your work or read any mention of them, please contact me at the email provided here with the name of your research team, and we would be more than happy to help investigate your findings and continue this wonderful project. So, thank you. Where did this second map come from? How long has it been there? Uh, the numbers are reordered, and that would be fine, but the locations are also slightly different. Who would put up something like that? How do they know? Wait a minute. Which one is the right one? Do we know which map is the right map? It's not like we can just guess and figure it out. It's got nothing to do with where the real markers are. Please tell me we...